I'd like to read this evening uh, two different verses. Well, I'll read uh, two sets of different verses. And we'll read verses 1 through 4 of chapter 19, and then we'll read uh, verses 13 through 16. We've been in a study of the book of Acts. We've been looking at what happens when God's power, the power of God's, God the Spirit, comes into the life of a believer. And uh, we have to be careful about how we talk about God the Holy Spirit. And it's because many times we neglect the fact that He is a person. And much of theology neglects the fact that God the Holy Spirit is part of the personality of God just as much as God the Father, God the Son. Many times we speak of the Holy Spirit as it. And I don't think we'd like to be spoken about as it and Him. But uh, we ought to speak respectfully and reverently of God the Holy Spirit. By the way... God the Holy Spirit is every bit as much a part of your salvation as God the Father, God the Son. Amen. God the Father sent uh, God the Son and He used the power of God the Holy Spirit. And when you got saved, God's Holy Spirit is the individual who personally told you about your need for Jesus, convinced you of your sin, and showed you that you could be saved. And so He's the one that ministers to you very personally and you ought to get to know Him and uh, I don't know that it is uh, scriptural necessarily for us to pray to God the Holy Spirit, but uh, it wouldn't hurt anything, wouldn't be inappropriate. And so when you pray to God the Father, remember that you ask Him request because of God the Son. And friend, you know what to pray for because God, God's, God the Spirit shows you what to pray for. And you need Him. You need God's Spirit. You need to be aware of the presence and the power of God's Holy Spirit. And the early church was established not as a result of a brilliant idea or a brilliant strategy. It was established as a result of God's Spirit moving and working in great demonstration of supernatural power. In many ways, God's Spirit works in a supernatural way. By the way, that's the only way God works is supernaturally. Uh, you and I can do what man does and we don't need God to do that. You know, most of the time we spend our prayer time, our prayer life, praying for things that man can do. And I don't think it's wrong to pray about small things and for God's leading in the, uh, in the minute details of life. I certainly don't think that that would be wrong. We have to do everything we do by conviction. But I'll tell you something, if you're serving the Lord, you'll have a reason for everything you do and you'll just do it. But when you want to see God do a work, you pray and ask Him to do what you cannot do. And then you'll never wonder who did it. You know, you can go out and accomplish something, and if it's something that a man can do, then, well, it may not be so. You may not know whether you did it or whether God did, but if you ask God to do something that man cannot do, then you'll be certain when he does it that it was him that did it. And by the way, I've seen him do that many times. That ought to be what you focus your prayer life on, what you need God to do that you can't do yourself. Well, I didn't mean to get into that little excursion, but we've been studying... Um, the power of God's Spirit, what happens when the power of God's Spirit comes into the life of believers. And we see that something always happens uh, every time God's power comes into the life of a believer, and that is that the gospel is preached every time and that souls come to Christ. And that's the precedent that we see in the book of Acts. When God empowers His people, it's to preach the gospel, and the result of it is that God does what God does when the gospel is preached. Souls are saved by the way, at the same time, many individuals resist God's Spirit and many folks are not saved. Many folks reject the gospel, but people always get saved when God's Spirit moves and works. That would happen in Fort Lauderdale if God's Spirit were moving and working. And that will begin when God's Spirit moves and works among us. And so be um, mindful of those things as we read our text this evening. Chapter 19 of Acts, and we're going to read down to verse 4. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then it said, uh, in verse 3, And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily, that means truly, John truly, or John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. We'll read verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, go with me down, if you will, to verse 13. 
Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Seva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was, leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was all known to the Jews and Greeks, also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. We'll pray. We'll ask the Lord's help as we endeavor to make application from the Scripture tonight. Heavenly Father, help us tonight, we pray. We recognize that uh, we can only do what man does. God, we can look at your word and we can make it an intellectual book. And with the limited intellect that we're created with, we could grasp and understand certain truths. But God, tonight we don't need to have knowledge because knowledge puffs up. God, we need charity that edifieth. And we need, as well, uh, your word to have application to our hearts that both humbles us and shows us our needs. And so, Father, tonight I ask that you would do that with your word, that you would make it alive and to speak to us. We know that it's powerful and sharp and a two-edged sword. God, give us the words. Give me the words as I preach tonight to speak to the hearts of individuals, both to challenge and encourage. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we begin the first part of chapter 19 with uh, a bit of a transition. We speaks of Apollos being at Corinth. And, uh, of course, we met Apollos at Corinth. If you'll remember, he was a man who was devout, who had... Uh, believe, but he hadn't uh, hadn't been taught everything. Now, Corinth was a very special place for Paul. If you'll recall with me, Paul went to Corinth and he went into the synagogue and he disputed and he, he reasoned with the Jews there, but didn't have a very effective ministry except for the ministry that he had with a couple of individuals with whom he lived, and that was Aquilas, Aquila and Priscilla. Now, they were tent makers. They had a common trade, but they were also believers in Jesus, and Paul had the ministry of teaching or training those individuals. Then we see that Timothy and Silas came uh, to Corinth where Paul was, and Paul's ministry changed. The Spirit moved in him to preach the gospel, and instead of going in the synagogue and reasoning with them, he simply preached the truth to them and challenged them to believe in Jesus Christ. Well, it wasn't well received, and Paul, as a result, decided... Um, he, he basically, if you will, shook the dust off of his feet and he told them, he says, your blood's on you and I'm not responsible for you anymore. And he said, I'm going to go and I'll preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He leaves that place and he goes to another place. He joins himself to where an individual named Crispus, who's the chief of a synagogue, is. And the difference in these synagogues is this man Crispus is the first to believe and all his house. Incidentally, Crispus is the one that in the, first, in the first letter that's inspired in the Bible to the church at Corinth, Paul mentions, he, remember he said, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius. And so we see the account of Paul's baptizing Crispus. And what happened in Corinth at that time was that Paul is at a place in his life, it really is a transition in his ministry. Everywhere he's gone up to this point, he's been beaten, he's been uh, treated terribly, and left for dead many times. His ministry, he's seen God work in power, but every time God moves and works in power, just about kills Paul physically, and that's no pun, really seriously, it does. And so God appears to Paul in a vision, and he tells him that while he's at Corinth, nothing is able to harm him. And so, uh, following this, there's been a great gathering of believers and a great moving in Corinth, and things are greatly changed in Corinth with the result that the Jews who are in opposition to the gospel are raising up, stirring up strife, and so they bring Paul before the judgment seat of Gallio, one of the uh, Roman judgment seats. Gallio says to him, he says, you know what, I don't have anything to do with religious matters. Get him out of here. And then the Greeks, the Bible says following that, they took the uh, chief of the, um, of the Jews or the... Uh, what's, I better look it up because I'm saying the wrong term. I know his name. What's his title? Chief ruler of the synagogue, Sosthenes. And they beat him within an inch of his life. And so here they brought Paul in to be beaten, to be a scourge, hopefully from their mindset to be put to death. And the result of it is that God has promised Paul protection. said, so nothing can harm you in Corinth. And so Paul goes before the judgment seat. Gallio says, I don't want to hear it. Paul opens his mouth to defend himself. And Gallio says, don't bother defending yourself. This isn't the sort of thing that belongs here. Get out of here. I don't need to hear this. 
And so he couldn't be tried, couldn't be judged. And then they took the individual that was a leader in being responsible for persecuting Paul, and they beat him within an inch of his life. And there was a bit of justice.